6th of April, isn't it? Yeah, 6th of April. Today is the 6th of April, 2003. We're in Boone, Iowa. Do you prefer Bob or Robert? Bob. And would you spell your last name? Forney, F-O-R-N-E-Y. And are you a native of Boone? No, I'm a neighbor of a little town of Pilot Mound, up here about 14 miles away. Is that where you were living when you became a soldier? Mm-hmm. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I left with the National Guard when the Guard was mobilized in 1941. Give me one second. I need to move your lamp, otherwise we're getting a nice picture of your lamp and not you. Um, where, where were you sent in 41 when you were mobilized? We went down to Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. And they, that's when they, that was a period of time they mobilized every state's National Guard. You see, this was, this was prior to of December the 7th. Did you know where they were going to send you after, they, after training? No. Where, where did no, they? we thought we were going to come home. <laughs> see, we were mobilized in, in February, you're supposed to be for a year. So we were getting ready to come home, and December the 7th happened, and that. Where did they send you after December 7th? Well, I stayed right there because we were in a provisional anti-tank battery, and uh, we didn't, the whole time we was there, they had never really decided on a weapon or anything for us. And uh, the division itself moved out and went to Fort Dix, New Jersey. And from there? And then from there they went to went to Ireland. Where, did, where were you this whole time? Well, I stayed right at Camp Claiborne, and a bunch of us t took a notion to try to get into the Air Corps, and we transferred to the Air Corps, took the cadet examination, and transferred to the Air Corps and learned to fly. If you had stayed with the original division, the reserves, would you have been with the 34th Division? Mm-hmm. Because they went to Africa. Yeah, they went to Africa. Mm -hmm. But you, you had a different fate. So you, you got into the Air Corps. Mm -hmm. What did they send you with the Air Corps? After the training, after I got my wings, we went for, out to Clovis, New Mexico. And we picked up, uh, we went to B-24 transition and there they gave me a crew. And uh, we went to Charleston, South Carolina where we formed a new, where it was forming a new group. We, we were the 454th Bomb Group, and we went through uh, group training there, and they said, oh, well, we we're going to, you'll be here a little while, and so I sent for my wife, and within about two, three days, they were sending, they started flying in new airplanes, and uh, shortly after Thanksgiving, yeah, we were there Thanksgiving, after Thanksgiving, we, we Took our, went our air, took our airplane and went to um, Mitchell Field, Long Island. And that's uh, Thanksgiving 1940? Well, this would have been 42. 42, okay. Mm -hmm. Give me one second. All right. So where did they send you out to after that? Well, after we went through that, we went down through West Palm Beach, Florida, and then down through Trinidad, Belém, Natal, Brazil. Sat there for about a week because the weather was lousy in, in Africa, and the ATC chain was plugged up. They, they sent you to Brazil. So you went down the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. How long did that take to get from there to Brazil in those days? Oh. Uh, we took off from West Palm Beach, Florida, and we flew from there to Trinidad. That was one day, and then we flew from Trinidad to Belém one day, and from it, you know just a few flying hours. It's amazing. And then we went from Trinidad to or from Belém to Brazil, or Natal in Brazil. That's where that's right out on the point. And then Christmas night of 1943, we flew the ocean. How long did that take you? About uh, 10 hours. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like to fly Christmas night? Did you fly at night? Mm -hmm. What was that like? Black. We, uh, we, we'd been at the beach all day. Playing around? 
playing around, just you know, come back and the air was, uh, left the bulletin board and we were scheduled to go that night. The reason we took off at night is because you flew back over the equator and you wanted to cross, when you crossed the equator there was thunderstorms build up on all along that route there and they told us you hit it during the cool of the night those thunderstorms wouldn't be built so high. And so that was the reason we wanted to hit that equator about daylight, just as it was, you know. And that was the reason we took off at night. I, I can remember we took off that night and we took off towards the ocean. There wasn't a light one and it was just blacker than black. How long did it take you to cross the ocean? Oh, about 10 hours, I think. I can't remember exactly anymore. And, and when did you arrive when you got to the side? Where? Yeah. Went to Dakar in Africa. Where the, you know, where Dakar kind of bellies down from the other direction. Okay. And where did they send you that you finally got captured? Where? Well, from from Dakar, we flew up into, to, uh, we was headed for Marrakech. And we had to go through a pass in the Atlas Mountains, and they told us to contact the radio in the pass, and if you couldn't go through it, Oh, I think it was 9,000 feet. Why? Then we had to turn back, and there was a little landing, emergency landing field in the desert there. And that landing field that was actually a, a foreign legion outpost. Well, we got there, and we couldn't get through, so we went back and landed, and they we landed in there that afternoon with over four, 104 engine airplanes all going up through there and uh, of course consequently the the normal camp complement it was a foreign legion outpost was about 60 people and they were all out on patrol so we just stayed in the airplanes all night and next morning took out of there and went up into French Morocco Marrakech and uh, stayed there overnight and the next day we went landed at a place called out south of Tunis called uh, Udna Number no. One, and it was a it had been an operational field. The British had used it during the Battle of North Africa because there was a no oh, no Wellington lane down there on the end of the field there that was had made a bat, crash landing coming home. They had just drug it off to one side. And, where, where were you ultimately captured? How did that happen, and where? Well, we uh, we left uh, that Tudna, Udna number one when the, all the group rendezvoused there. Our whole, whole group got together, and I was one of the first, about the first airplane there. And uh, when we landed, the guy came around around now and I said, "Where are we?" And he said, "Udna number one." And I said, well, "Okay, now what do we do?" He said, "Well." There's a line of tents up there, just go pick you out one to get in it. So we lived there and, and uh, I forgot how long that was. We, I think we moved up to, we moved to, up to Italy because we flew our first group combat mission along about the first part of February. So, uh, and of course, when we, when we moved up to Italy, the uh, there was tents and everything set up for it because our ground crew was already there. They'd come by boat, and they we had tents set up, but that was all. We didn't have a mess hall. We didn't have you know it was just bare. So where where were you captured and when? Well, I got shot down the nineteenth of March. Over. Oh, we were up, uh, it was northern Yugoslavia or southern Austria, and um, I forget the name of the little town that was by, but it was in very, very hill of country. We were in the foothills of the Alps. And this is 1943? No, I got shot down on the 19th of March of 44. 44? Mm -hmm. Okay. When they shot you down, who who actually apprehended you? Did well, it was uh, it was an occupied territory, and 
the kid, the people that really got us was Hitler Youth. How did they treat you when they? Well, they didn't. They didn't. Uh, they kids didn't have. We didn't have trouble with the kids at all. You know, they. Uh, I had a forty-five under my carried you know shoulder holster, and of course they took that away from me, and they proceeded to shoot up all the ammunition I had with me. They were just out there playing or anything else. How old were these kids? Well, Hitler Youth. They were young teenagers. Were they soldiers as such, or were they so like? Well, they were uniformed, yeah. So, you, were you in Austrian territory or in Yugoslavian territory? Well, uh, we don't know. I don't know exactly. So, we're on the border, right in there, someplace. Rather, these were actual German troops. And when we got to, when we got to the, they took us into a schoolhouse. That was a, that they were using for their headquarters. And that's where we stayed that first night. The, they had they used part of that school building for their headquarters and then the next morning why the kids come to school in the other part. Did they did did they give you anything to eat or drink? Did they rough you up any No, no, not nothing like that. They yeah, they give us uh, I remember the first thing that we got was some Swiss cheese. And uh, just cheese. Yeah. Oh, I think we had some. Maybe they might have given us some coffee or something. Or that we, you know, bread. Probably bread. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, did anyone interrogate you? Not too much there. Not. No, they didn't. Didn't ask. We didn't. Anybody. We. Then. Uh, they next morning they transported us out of there by truck, and we went down to Zagreb. You know, that's at the head of the. Mediterranean up there, you know, up by, way up by the boot, you know, and uh, there we, we, there they put us in a regular bona fide jail, you know, and uh, day or two later, I can't say, can't remember how it was, they, they took us, we loaded on a, in a train, and they sent troops along with us, guards along with us, and we just rode in regular passenger cars, and, uh, we went to Dulag Luft, and that was at Frankfurt on the Main, and that was the big interrogation center for all the... Uh, and you traveled to, up to this point by train, mm -hmm. in these 40 by 8s, these freight No, we didn't get into those until after we got out of this Dulag Luft, and that, that was the big interrogation center. What sort, of, what sort of trains were these that took you to Frankfurt? These were just regular passenger trains, because... Uh, there were, they had people on them with skis. They was going up in the mountains skiing and that kind of stuff. But we had regular. We were in regular compartments. Were you only POWs, or were there civilians in the same compartments? Uh, there were just just POWs because those those European type trains had had compartments. There so, you, and were there guards in yeah. every compartment? Yeah, there were guards with us. Did you have any contact with civilians? What what did you see any? Oh yeah, we saw civilians. How did they? Look back at you. How did they? They pay attention to us. The only time they ever paid any attention to us was when we were coming into the train station at Frankfurt on the Main the night before the the British had bombed it, bombed the area, and uh, we were standing in this train station and with our guards all around us, and they were a bunch of old guys that were just getting a chance to go home on leave, you know. They weren't paying a whole lot of attention to us, and all of a sudden the air raid sirens went off. And there was some guy, oh, he was a kind of a goony looking guy, and he got all excited. And, and those crowds, when they get excited, they just splutter, you know. And they, and but we had guys with an understanding that German that he was yelling and yelling that the that the fliegers, the flyers, is what had. His family, some of his family had been killed in a bombing raid, and they were just, he was in, in, inciting the crowd, you know, and they just acted, felt it like they were just getting closer and closer and closer to you. And all of a sudden, the train backed in, backed in, and there was a German sergeant on the back end of it, and he barked something at that crowd, and they, they just broke up and went on. But that was, uh, that was as close as we ever come to any being anybody paying any attention to us whatsoever. About how many people do you think were in that crowd? I wouldn't have any idea.
But they seem pretty threatening. I mean, yeah, I think that they they were they were just felt like they were just moving in a little closer all the time. And we were just kind of standing and huddling, and we everybody just said, you know, just, you know, just don't pay any attention to them. Just kind of look around. And How many POWs were there together in this little group that was huddling? Uh, well, I can't even tell you that anymore. A large group or a small group? Just small group. So, what was the interrogation like? Well, they, we went up. You went up there, and uh, of course, they were right away. They wanted to know, you know, uh, who the who the pilots were, pilots of the crew. Well, that wasn't hard for them to figure out. But anyway, we all got put in solitary confinement. And it was just a little bit of a room with a bed in it, and light. And, you know, it was a. It wasn't really the old doom and gloom, solitary, like you, you think about, but, oh, I don't know, I can't remember now, it took, they probably kept us there two or three days, and then uh, called me up one day, picked me up, and took me in to, to be interrogated. And this guy could speak very good English, and of course they wanted to know where you were going, what you were doing, of course, you know, you could only give them your name, rank, and serial number, and I just kept telling him that that was all I could tell him and he said he said well he said you know we got ways we can make you talk and I said well I suppose and pretty soon he said well if you won't tell me I'll tell you and he reached around behind him and on a bookshelf behind him was a bunch of notebooks and it turned it over and there it was 454th bomb group and it opened it up and right to my squadron and they had us right down right to Right to flight crews and the whole works. Really? Yeah. The list of the men who, mm -hmm. their names and everything? Yeah. How the hell do they get that stuff? You would think that we've got good uh, security, you know. They, they knew what was going on. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. That right down to the names of the flight yeah. crews. Mm -hmm. Do they know where you were from or? No, they didn't know that, and of course, of course, they always wanted to know where you were going, you know, where you were going. Well, they had that pretty well figured out also, and I never, we never did have to tell, never did tell them. Did they ever slap you around, or? No. The only time that I ever got touched was back in those hills of Yugoslavia, or wherever it was we got picked up, and uh, all these different groups that picked up the the individuals, they kind of all brought us together and we gathered up by a, took us to a, a, a little, like a country store way out in the weeds, you know. And uh, some, one of their NCOs come out and he counted, like he went, counted noses around, pretty soon he come out and everybody had a bottle of beer for everybody. Well, after we had that, did that, we started down. We started down the trail walking, you know. And this the day before I got shot down. I'd been up to Foggia and had a B-24 painted on the back of my flying jacket. And as we was walking down there, some of those soldiers are kind of gathered around, and uh, somebody come up behind me and said something and just pushed me in the back with the butt of his rifle. And just, you know, just kind of pushed and said something, I suppose, about that airplane. And uh, that was the only time I ever was, was ever touched or threatened or anything. But the next time I got a chance, I wore that jacket inside out. This uh, beer bottle incident interests me. So, That was just after being captured. Mm -hmm. And who was the guy who did the, who gave you the beer? Who were these people? They well, were the Hitler of, Youth. One of the one of those German NCOs. How long had you been captured? An hour, two, three? Yeah. And he gave you all a bottle of beer. Mm -hmm. Why? I don't know. See that in Balen out was we was scattered all over the hills down there. And they had people out all over and then they uh, I know when I when I landed, I landed in a tree, and uh, 
I finally kind of worked myself loose and got out of the harness and I wasn't very far off the ground. But come on, it's this small tree. And the uh, here come a family up the trail. A man, my wife, and a oh very young teenage girl, I would say, maybe not quite a teenager, and. Uh, they kind of shied away from me, but uh, I happened to have some, I had a pack of cigarettes with me, and I offered them a guy a cigarette. But they, and then I pointed to my chute hanging in the tree, and the little girl that make you know good material to make a dress for. Her. But they finally they, they got on out of there. But it wasn't long after that, some of these German or these Hitler youth kind of popped out of the brush, and and. Uh, how long did the family stay and talk with you? Not very long. Five, five minutes at the most. Were they kind? Were they... Yeah. They were scared. Scared of me. They didn't want anything to do with me. Because they, you know, they knew that, knew that we were American and uh, probably they weren't sympathetic to the cause at all. But they were just existing and living in those hills and so forth. So, so we're back to Frankfurt. An interrogation. Where did where did you go after the Frank went to Duflag? Dulag. Dulag. Well, we then when we then when we got in the forty and eight box cars yes. and went all the way up to Barth, Germany. It's clear up on the north side. What was the train trip like? Cold. It was in the winter time, and. Uh, they had, there was some straw on the floor. Fortunately, I had pertinently all the clothes on that that I had bailed out with. But uh, some of the guys, particularly, so there was some fighting. By that time, we were getting a mixed group, you know. Everybody, this was a train load of people that, that had been built up in the, down at the interrogation center, and we were being moved out. And some of those guys, particularly, there was a, a fighter pilot there and uh, they took everything away from you that said gov was marked government you know and he was he was cold because they'd gotten down he all he had left was he's i think it was a like an, either an electric flying suit or they left him the this these old coverall type flying suit on and i was i remember i don't believe he had much of a jacket on and were you given any food this whole time yeah we got food occasionally what did you get Oh, probably bread and ersatz coffee, you know, and maybe I got some soup. I don't remember. They were great on split pea soup, you know. And when you got to Barth, what did you find? When we got to Barth, well, that's when we got back into our own, you know, we started seeing our own people. I got to shut that thing off a minute. You had just arrived at Bart. Well, we got off, of come, in, come in by train, and uh, when we got off up there, why they, we marched out to the camp. Where, where I have been, actually. I've been mm -hmm. out there. To the, to the, I've been to the ruins of the camp. Have you? Mm -hmm. It's all trees now. It's just yeah. Mm -hmm. How far was that from the town out there? I can't oh, remember. Oh, only a mile or two. Yeah, I didn't think it was very far, you know. And we marched out there, and they, uh, I think they got us right away. They got us into, uh, I think we got, run us through a shower, and they give us a, a Red Cross black suitcase made out of fiber, you know, the, like two-piece thing with a strap around it. And it had a change of clothes and underwear and, socks and stuff like that and if I remember right that yeah they give us a you know took us to a place and and uh, we took a shower and uh, de-loused us because first I never got into any bug problems any time I was there and well, uh, how was that most people did or are you lucky well we were in a very good we as prison camps go, we were in a good, you know, 
we our sanitation was good. We had the barracks that I was in. We had running water and and uh, stool, not hot water. You know, at least we had we had stools. And there were showers there if you were, if you were strong enough to take a cold shower. You know. How often did you shower? Oh, I don't know. And of course, it never got too warm even in the summertime. We usually, if we were going to take a bath, we'd just go over to the mess hall. We had a mess hall. And you could get a bucket of hot water and you could just come back and take a sponge off bath. Yeah. But how often did the men usually bathe? Well, we got, the, we had that shower house, and I can't tell you what the frequent, can't remember what the frequent, maybe there wasn't any cycle on it anyway, but every once in a while they'd say, well, such and such a barrack is, is scheduled for. Shower. And, and how did you boys spend your time? You ha you were had all this time. What what sort of food did you get? What what free time? Oh, was there any sports activities going on? Were you yeah, there a big boxing match? Well, they had they played a lot of softball in the summertime. They had they got up a, a, a few tournaments. You know, from the, each barracks would maybe put out a a team. Where did they get the? Um, Balls and bats. It comes through the YMCA. Did a YMCA representative come and visit? How how did they deliver this stuff? Well, I don't know how it got there, but we had representatives from the Red Cross would come in, and that's how we got our food parcel. See, the Red Cross was the that was the the delivery. The Were these Swedish Red Cross workers or Danish or French or never saw one. Oh. They so only who, visited the higher headquarters. They're up in, you know. So who handed out the packets? The Germans. Oh. And the Germans would, um, each one of these packages, each one of these Red Cross parcels was about that big a square and about that thick. And well, four of them could fit edgeways and about the size of a 30 dozen egg case. What were they wrapped in? Cardboard. Were there any labels on them or the decorations? On the, what, what? On the package, were the, was there a label that said what it was? Or? No, I don't remember that. And what was inside? Well, there was um, a can, a pound can of dried whole milk, usually a, a meat of some kind, spam, corned beef, uh, Usually a fish product of some kind. Once in a great while there'd be tuna, you know, mostly salmon. Uh, D ration chocolate. C ration cookies. That was like a big heavy graham cracker. What's the, what are all these D and C markations? What does that mean? D ration, C ration? And well, that, that, that was a type of ration bar. That was just a nomenclature for things that, you know, you, that, that deration chocolate was actually a kind of a desert chocolate because it was, it was hard and, and uh, it, wasn't, wasn't, it wasn't Hershey chocolate. It tastes very nice? Yeah, it was good tasting. We had a guy in my room, that was the first night that we, I got assigned to a room. We were 16 in a room and he happened to be sleeping in the top bunk and, and I was over two or three spaces from him on a lower bunk, way kind of like back in the corner. And uh, they had gotten Red Cross food parcels that day, and he dearly loved that deration chocolate. And that night, after they turned the lights out on us, we was kind of laying there, and everybody was just ready to drop off to sleep. And pretty soon, somebody said, "Oh," and then "Oh" again. And about the third "Oh," everybody straightened up. He was having a nightmare, and it was caused we figured out later that it was from eating that chocolate. So we told him no more of that. Did he scream out or just that oh moaning, you know? Did you guys get anything else in these packets? Cigarettes or there was cigarettes. I've forgotten how many packages of cigarettes in a par in in one. And vitamins. Any toilet tree articles? Shaving cream or Razor blades? No, these were basically food parcels. Um, you were talking about living in Bart. What was the weather like? Kind of cold. 
Yeah, it was. It, it, it never got good in... It never got good in... Um, hardly warm in the summertime. You, you could, there's a few days in the summer that the boys would kind of lay out and, and, and sunbathe. They took us to the ocean a time or two to, to swim, you know, but it was too cold. It wasn't... You they know. took you to the ocean? Yeah. See, the North Sea is right up there. How did they take you in... in Just walk. See, it wasn't very far to the water. Was there soap? Did they give you soap to wash with? No, this was just to, just, just to swim, if you wanted to. You didn't have swimming shorts? No. You guys went nude? I suppose. I don't remember it, no. Um, what were the sanitation conditions like in Bud? Well, we did, we did pretty good, like I told you. We had, uh, we had stools, you know and showers, if you could handle a cold shower, and uh, I can't remember, was there wash basins in there? I've forgotten. But we were lucky, we never really got, you know, we never had any, got any disease problems of any kind. What was your interaction with, with the com camp commander, the guards, the, with the Germans in general? Uh, <coughs> we were we were pretty well organized in a semi quasi military we, that we had to stand roll call every twice a day each barracks lined up and your barracks commander was out in front and then he reported to our senior senior officers each one of these was called a squadron and the whole thing was called a group and he and then the Germans would walk down one guy one in front and one in back and they would count noses, you know, in how many was in. But it was the Americans reading off the names. Well, they we only they didn't read names, they just did it by numbers, head count. And then if those Germans had miscount, then they'd have to recount and recount then recount, you know. And uh, the bulk of the time it was uh, well, you know, a cold cold weather, it was kind of miserable standing out there. In the rain as well? Rain, and, well, rain or snow, it didn't make any difference. But very little snow we had. What about the liberation? Well... So you spent the rest of the war up until the it part? Mm -hmm, yeah. What about liberation? Well, uh, they told us that the war was we knew the war was getting close because uh, we had a um, the guys in trading cigarettes. Cigarettes was our medium of exchange, and that was what they used to trade with the with the Germans, barter with them. And the guys that could speak, and there's only one guy from each barracks could do the trading, so that they control it. See, if everybody got into the act, well, then the, your, your cigarette value would go to pot. So they traded, they talked, they got these Germans to bring them radio parts. And you've got somebody, you know, <coughs> you've got the <coughs> people that can do anything, and they built a radio that uh, they'd get together, and everybody had a piece of that radio. The Germans would bring you radio parts? Yeah, the guards. Secretly? Secretly, that's right. And they'd put that radio together, and they'd all get together at a certain time of day and put that radio together and listen to BBC. And we kept track of the war, because then they, they, would, they printed the newspaper every, night, every day. Secret, or did the Germans know about the No, newspaper? no, the Germans didn't know about that either. What they printed on? This paper. Where did they get the paper at? I had any idea. Did they have a press or did they did it by hand? No, they did it by hand with a typewriter. They'd make several copies of it and somebody from your barracks was designated every day to go up to the head shed, as we called it, and get the copy for your, your barracks. And then at night after they shut the Germans shut the shutters, why somebody was always standing looking out, you know, looking, and everybody that wanted to hear the news would go to one room and somebody would read it. And then when it was over, they'd go back and then the, the next day they would take and take that piece of paper back. And I've never heard of such a thing. Mm -hmm. 
So the German se guards were secretly bringing you radio parts, mm -hmm. and you guys would give them cigarettes. Mm -hmm. What if they'd been caught? Well, I suppose it would have been tough. Why weren't the Germans just stealing the cigarettes out of the Red Cross packages before they gave them to you? Well, maybe they did. We don't know. But that was one thing that that uh, that they uh, that uh, they ship. Uh, your family could go to a tobacco company, and they would send the, the tobacco company would send you a case of cigarettes. You know. And uh, I think I hear my car out here. And uh, I think it just cost them very, very minimal. Anything you want to say about the liberation? Yeah, let me talk to you. Okay. So the last question would be about how the liberation played out. Well, uh, the Russians liberated us. And when they come in, uh, they come in on horses, had a bunch of Mongolians, horses, and the, the Russian leader was in a regular spring wagon drawn by a team of horses. And uh, they had told us, told us ahead of time that whenever we, if we had wo ever woke up some morning and the German guard was gone, don't get outside the barbed wire because that might be the only protection that you got because they didn't know how the civilians were going to react without some military control around them. But uh, when the Russians got there, why the boys soon fanned out and went all, you know, got around the countryside. There was an airport about five miles from us. We went over there and I don't know, there was not too much to see. It was just, just an airport. It had been a it was kind of the basis for a, for a German flak school, where they trained flak gunners. What were the men looking for when they went outside the camp? Were they hoping to find food or just a way out? Just nosing around, because they knew that there was no place to go, just to, just to set tight. When the Russian uh, commander got to our senior Allied officer, and he, they, they wanted to taken marches to a railhead from there and then take us to the Black Sea and out. And he said, no, he said, we flew to Germany, we're going to fly home. So that took about another week to get that all arranged. All that, that all had to go back through Moscow and then to... He wants to take you to the Black Sea or the Baltic Sea? Black Sea. That's a long ways away. Well, yeah, but they're going to put us on a, a train and go down through that way, see. That'd be out through the Mediterranean. Well, that, you know, there we found out now that there were some POWs evacuated out that way, and they never got home. What happened to them? They're in Germany. They were in Russia, someplace or other. Um, did the Russians arrive armed in these in this wagon with horses, or did they come unarmed? Oh, they were armed. Yeah, that and that's this guy that had this the commandant or the of that outfit. He had he had a he had a lady friend with him. Uh, this. Had his Tommy gun leaning across the back end of the wagon. And the lady friend was sitting next to him in the wagon. The what? Was the lady friend sitting next to him in the wagon? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you got liberated. How did you finally get home? Well, we, uh, when they got this all worked out, they flew airplanes into this airport about five miles from us, and they flew us out. And you eventually got back to... We went back to... They flew us... Uh, out of there, and we landed at uh, Reims, France. And then they took us by truck to Le Havre, where all the cigarette camps were. You know, I was in Camp Lucky Strike. And then we eventually got on a boat and come home. What was it like to return home home? Well, it was home. You know, it just you. You know, you got to see your family and your wife. And what was it like to see them again for the first time? Well, uh, I met her in Minneapolis because that, that was where I asked to get sent to. And uh, then we flew home by air from, from up there.
got on an airliner and flew home. From Minneapolis to Des Moines. Government's expense or uh, yours? All of my own. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else that you want to say that you think we might have forgotten? Any? How do you feel about the Germans today? Well, uh, I think the bulk of the Germans are outside of a few of those fanatics. You know, they were just like everybody else. They were just a, had had job to do. Somebody gave them a job to do. And one thing I was going to tell you about that liberation when we that guy wanted to take us out through the Baltic Sea and or down through the Mediterranean Sea. Why, and our senior commander, old Colonel Zemke, said, no, we flew over here, we're going to fly home. Well, if you're going to stay here, what do you need? And he said, food, you know. Well, be just before they got there, the German commander had come to our senior allied commander and said he had a warehouse full of Red Cross food parcels and the, c the c citizens had found them. And he didn't have the manpower to keep the citizens out. And he said, if you want to send details in there to get those, why, I'll give you what protection I can. So we went in groups of 50 and come back, and each one of us carrying a, one of those things, cases, that had four in it. So then they decided they weren't going to stack them up in that camp because they knew if the Russians was coming, if they found a pile of anything, that was theirs. So everybody took his own. Well, of course, right away the guys had been on short rations, and they broke into those things, and they ate the goodies. And the first thing you know, we had some whole bunch of sick people. Because that rich food, that condensed whole milk and cheese and, and dried uh, instant coffee and stuff like that. But the thing was that when they said you wanted food, okay, you got food. We woke up one morning and there was 50 head of cattle outside of the gate. The Russians drove down there and said, there's your food. So we put out a call for butchers and in a day or two we had meat. Because, you know, in a group that big, you can find somebody can do anything. How many men were in the camp at that point? By the time, by the, time the camp was, or the war was over, we had somewhere between nine and 10,000. And you got 50 cows. Mm -hmm. And they butchered them. They butchered them. What, what did they make out of them? Uh, I kind of even forgotten that. Probably something that could be fried because our cooking was, you know, we didn't have, in the interim, you see, our our mess all burnt down. We think maybe the, the Germans did burnt that down on, on purpose to keep the Russians from getting in there and giving them a, a, a mass feeding facility. Where was this uh, stash of food that you guys went to get from the civilians? How far away was that warehouse? It was in this town of Bar, someplace or other. It wasn't very far. In like a warehouse. Mm -hmm. And who tipped you off that it was there? The German? The German, the German commandant. Camp commandant. And this was before the Germans uh, before, split the scene. Before, yeah, before the Russians left, and he he knew that probably knew that the war was kept getting close to the end. So was that like uh, within the week before the Russians came? I can't tell you that. I suppose. Okay. Anything else, Bob? No. That's fine. Okay. Uh.